In this video, we're going to talk more in depth about the air. And we'll start with some anatomy. We'll start with the external air, the thing you can see outside. And this is everything you can see outside and even everything you can see when you poke in the air with an otoscope. So that would be your air canal and your tympanic membrane, right? That's everything you can see externally. So that's your external air. External ear. And I'll draw it off out like this. This is your ear and your earlobe. Your ear canal and your tympanic membrane. Tympanic membrane. Now, a little bit deeper, you have a, a series of three bones, MIS, malleus, incus, stapes. Three tiny bones, and they're actually the smallest bones in your body. And they all link to each other and work in conjunction. So all right, malleus, incus, stapes. And they sense vibration and transmit that vibration into what we'll talk about next, the inner part of your ear. So I kind of gave it away, there's an inner part of the ear, so that would mean this would be the middle part of the ear, and that's exactly what it is. This is the middle part of the ear, middle part. And there's not just only these three bones, there are muscles here. There's a muscle that attaches to the stapes. Ooh, do you remember what that muscle was? That'd be your stapedius muscle. Stapedius. What did the stapedius muscle do? It dampened the stapes, stopped it from overfiring or hitting too hard. And what nerve innervated the stapedius muscle? Cranial nerve. Seven. Ah, things are things are coming back, right? Hopefully things are coming back. So there's a muscle that sticks on here and, and cranial nerve seven will take it and transport it where it needs to go, right? This is not the direction it goes. I just need to draw it out of the way. So cranial nerve seven. That is the middle ear. Now let's talk about the inner ear. This is a, a monstrosity, this giant, giant structure. At the top you have these three semi-circular canals called your semi-circular canals. And they're all orthogonal to each other, which means they're all at 90 degrees to each other, perpendicular. I'll tell you why that's important in a second, but you have these semi-circular canals, semi-circular, and they attach to this giant base called your vestibule. And in this base, this vestibule, you have cavities. One is called the utricle, utricle. One is called the saccule. All right, so that's within your vestibule. And then last but not least, at the end of your vestibule, you have this giant curled structure called your cochlea, cochlea. And your cochlea is filled with fluid, fluid. Things like perilymph. Things like endolymph and in this fluid you have these projections called hair cells all right so just keep that in mind that is your inner ear and that is actually your ear this is your in, in this entirety this is your ear this is your auditory pathway okay now let's talk about the function of your ear what's the main function of your ear transmit sound hearing how does your ear hear things well, sense vibration, wiggle, 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 hit the tympanic membrane, which will shake your malleus incus stapes. And this attaches to your inner ear through this oval window called the oval window and transmit that vibration, transmit that mechanical force. And this will vibrate the fluid, the fluid in your cochlea and your hair cells will sense that shift in fluid and it will depolarize, it will depolarize and it'll transmit signals to these nerves that are attached to your cochlea and your vestibule. And all these nerves will coalesce into one giant nerve. What do you think that giant nerve is called? What do you think the nerve that's attached to your vestibule and your cochlea is called? It's your vestibular cochlear nerve, cranial nerve eight. Cranial nerve eight. And it'll sense that signal, process it as sound. And, that's, and eventually all that, that energy, all that vibration will dissipate out this round window on the bottom called the round window. And then you kind of just start the process over again whenever there's new stimuli. That is how you hear. They might be kind of picky and they might ask you where in your cochlear 
cochlea, do you hear high frequency, low frequency? Well, in the base of your cochlea, where it kind of starts, it's, it's structurally different. And because it's structurally different, it can pick up different vibrations. Mainly, the base. Because the base is a little bit thinner, a little bit more rigid, you don't really need to know why it picks up these different vibrations or frequencies, but it does because it's thinner more rigid, it likes to pick up high frequencies. But as it travels towards the center, the little curly center, the apex, the apex is a little wider, a little bit more flexible, and this allows it to pick up low frequencies. That's just some nitpicky facts, but the general gist is it'll, it'll sense the, sh the shift in fluid. The hair cells will depolarize and send all these nerves, these impulses to your cranial nerve 8. Now just remind me, is cranial nerve 8 the only thing that contributes to our hearing? No. We said there is so much more to hearing than cranial nerve 8. Do you remember that? When we talked about the thalamus? What were some other structures? Well, we had cranial nerve 8. We also had input from our brainstem. In particular, your superior, olive, and your inferior, Colliculus. And the culmination of which went to your thalamus. Do you remember the exact part of your thalamus? If you do, gold star, gold star, it'd be your medial geniculate. And that all goes into your auditory cortex. And your auditory cortex is, of course, your temporal lobe. If you're able to recap all this and recall this, then you get high five me. High five me through your screen. That means you're paying attention during our talk on the thalamus. That is hearing. Now, we talked about this structure, this cochlear structure, but we didn't talk about the other structures, your semicircular canal, your utricular, your saccule. Why don't we talk about that? Well, what do they do? Well, another function of your ear is sensing movement and balance, or right, movement slash balance. So your vestibule with its utricular saccule and your semicircular canal all makes up this vestibular system and that deals with movement and balance. So your semicircular canals are also filled with fluid and when you move your head that fluid will displace and you'll sense the movement and you'll need to balance yourself. And the reason why they're all orthogonal, all 90 degrees, is that way it allows you to move your head in any which way and it's able to to sense that movement, sense that balance. So that's your semicircular canals. What about your utricles and your saccules? You're, they're also filled with fluid. They also have hair cells, but something that's important is that they have these little crystals. And when you move your head, the fluid will displace and the crystals will move. And your hair cells will sense both the fluid displacements and those little crystals. Do I want to write crystals? I don't think that's important, but just know they have crystals. So I'll draw little, little blocks, little crystals in your utricle and your saccule. And so these are all important in movement and balance, and sometimes things can go wrong. You can make things go wrong. I mean, if you spin around enough, then when you suddenly stop, you'll stop, but the fluid will still keep moving. It'll keep sensing that. And what do you feel? You'll feel dizzy. So it gathers all this information that you're moving, that, that you need to balance, and it'll send it to your brain to get it processed. So this whole vestibular system will sense movement, sense balance, peripherally, peripheral. And then it'll send that information to your brain to process it centrally. So you have kind of a two-parter when it comes to movement and balance. All right, what can go wrong other than spinning around really fast? You can have something wrong with your vestibular system. We call that peripheral deficits. You can have something wrong with your brain. We call it central deficits. And what do you think will happen? Well, your movement and your balance will go off. You'll feel like things are spinning when it shouldn't be. We call that vertigo. Vertigo. With a room spinning when you're stationary, when you're lying still. Central problems, we'll just kind of get it out of the way first. When you have central problems, something's wrong with your brain internally. Not your vestibular system, not your ear, but your brain. Things can be common like migraines. Things can be more severe like strokes or multiple sclerosis where you kind of knock out the brain processing center and you'll have vertigo, all right? Peripheral will be anything wrong with your vestibular system. That just makes sense. 
Now, how can you tell the two apart clinically? Well, central is something's wrong with your brain. You're going to have focal deficits, focal deficits. And because this is affecting your brain, not your vestibular system, not your ear, you're not really going to have hearing loss. All right, no hearing loss. Peripheral, because it's affecting your ear, you're going to have hearing loss. Hearing loss. And if it's only affecting your ear, you're not really going to have any focal deficits other than kind of the hearing loss. So it's just your hearing loss. Let's talk about peripheral. We're not going to talk about central too much. Let's talk about peripheral. You can have <clears throat> something called benign paroxysmal positional vertigo. The name really tells you a lot about it. Benign meaning it's, it's benign, it's not to do like cancer or anything. Paroxysmal means sudden attack, positional vertigo. So you have a sudden attack of vertigo that's triggered by change in position. And you can actually elicit this. If you sit the patient up and you drop them down, then they'll initiate that vertigo. And the reason why they have vertigo due to, due to changes in their position is because a crystal from our good friend Utricor, our psycho has dislodged and now it's floating around in her semicircular canal and displacing fluid, basically giving this patient vertigo. So a crystal displaced. If, if the proposed mechanism is a crystal some displaced somewhere in the semicircular canal and we know the structure of the semicircular canal, can't we just shift the head at certain directions until we dislodge the crystal out of the semicircular canal? Can we just move it? out of some circular canal, and that's exactly what we do. So we have this little system where we put the head to the left for a while and then put it to the right and kind of shift the crystal out. And I think that's, that's very, very clever because that takes a lot of direction. Yeah, I, I'll get lost in my own city that I've been born and raised in, but someone was able to figure out the direction where you can kind of shift the head and shift that crystal out. That is what we do for benign paroxysmal vertigo. You can have something else you can have Meniere disease, and this is due to excess fluid, excess endolymph. And we have excess endolymph, then you basically feel that displacement of fluid because you have too much of it, and you're feeling this vertigo for a very prolonged period of time. How can we fix this? Well, we can give a low salt diet, and that just reduces the fluid. We can give acetazolamide, which is a car an carbonic anhydrase inhibitor. A lot of fluid in certain organs are basic not basic as in like basic, basic, basic as in pH. And by blocking carbonic anhydrase, you kind of reduce that fluid. If things go, if things are very severe, then you can just put in a shunt. You shunt that fluid away. You can have vestibular neuritis. This is an infection to your vestibular system. You can imagine that causes vertigo. Sometimes it's post-infection. Yeah, sometimes it's kind of an autoimmune attack. So, so we can give corticos if that's the case, kind of damper that autoimmune response, reduce that vestibular neuritis. Last but not least, you can have drugs that cause ototoxicity. What's a drug that causes ototoxicity? We've talked about a few of them already. How about loop diuretics? Yeah, so a patient comes in heart failure, you give them furosemide, and suddenly they're having tinnitus, feeling like the room's shaking. Ototoxicity. That is all problems with vertigo. Now, I just want to talk about some general ear pathology. The most common is just ear infection. Let's just take some time to talk about ear infection. You can have an infection of your external ear, your outside ear. If you have gunk or earwax that you're not, not cleaning, you can get infected from things like staph. So right, external, staph. Or if you go for a swim and water is kind of just lodged in your ear for an extended period of time, or it doesn't have to be extended, but you can have pseudomonas. Pseudomonas. Doesn't pseudomonas love water? So you find a lot of pseudomonas in water, and if you swim, then you get that water at the pseudomonas in here. You can have external ear infection. We call that swimmer's ear. You can have infection of your, in of your middle ear. We call that otitis media. And otitis media is more commonly seen in upper respiratory tract infections. That's weird. Well, <clears throat> your mouth connects to your ears via your eustachian tube, so bacteria can kind of spread to there. So it spreads to there. And commonly it is strep pneumo.
H flu, Marxella. There's not a consensus of how you treat uh, otitis media middle ear infections. You can usually just wait it out, but you can also give them antibiotics, okay? Now, if you have persistent middle ear infections, otitis media, which is common in kids, then you can have then you have chronic inflammation, this chronic serous exudate. You can also have overgrowth of your tissue here. We call that overgrowth. We call this diatoma, oma, and it's basically an overgrowth of the keratin epithelium, and it can erode the structures in your middle ear, mainly your malus and cusabes cause hearing loss. What kind of hearing loss? Is it sensory? No. Is it conductive? Yes. So you can get conductive hearing loss. Conductive hearing loss. These are bacterial. You can also have viral infections in your middle ear. You can have herpes zoster. We call that Ramsey Hunt. Ramsey Hunt. So this is herpes zoster reactivating in your nerves. Herpes zoster loves to live in nerves and they can reactivate. This is not cranial nerve eight. So if it's not reactivating in cranial nerve eight, what nerve do you think it's reactivating in? There's only two. So it's reactivating in cranial nerve seven. Reactivating in the nerve that kind of attaches to your stapedius. There's a branch of cranial nerve seven that's called the geniculate branch <clears throat> or geniculate ganglion. Geniculate means bent at a sharp angle. So this is a nerve bundle or ganglion that's bent at a sharp angle. We just call it the geniculate ganglion. And when it reactivates, you're gonna see those vesicular lesions, because it's herpes, vesicular lesions in and around the ear. And also because it is cranial nerve seven, you're gonna see facial palsy. So all right, lesions plus palsy. And you'll know you're dealing with Ramsey Hunt. That's the pathology of your ear. That's your auditory pathway. Hope that clears things up. Thanks.